Okay, good morning, or perhaps strictly speaking, I should say, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's two minutes past, so I think although there are still some people trickling in, as it were, we should make a start. And um, we're going to dispense with the formal introductions. I think you all know more or less who I am. And uh, I want to start by apologizing for not being well enough to come into town last week and give the talk that you've been promised by way of introduction to the visit. But I understand from Aviva, although it was a small group, it was a really interesting and productive and, and uh, yeah, sort of fruitful visit. And uh, I would very much welcome, we've got a fairly small group, I think, assembling today, but you know, your input at the end would be much appreciated. I hope, you know, I'm curious to know what you made of this rather extraordinary and very memorable exhibition currently on at the National Gallery. Equally, I know that the numbers signed up for this talk are larger than those who actually came last week. So I assume, am I right, that most of you have already seen the show? And if not, well, I, all I can say is that I hope you will be <laughs> have your interest whetted in doing so um, in the wake of my, my talk. Um, very good. So let me let me let me sort of cut to the chase, as it were, without further ado. Ah, oh, hold on. I had this problem last night. Just, just give me um, what's happened here. Right. Can you see my screen, Emma? Am I okay? Yeah, we good. Lovely. All right, there we are. Um, the dates just for good measure. Um, clearly, what we have been doing these last few weeks is uh, celebrating, but also I think looking more closely and possibly quite critically at uh, Lucien Freud in the context of the wider family history on the occasion, of course, of the centenary of his birth in 1922 in Berlin. So what I'd like to do really today is to set the works that you will have seen or will see at the National Gallery in the wider context, providing, you know, yeah, I think a good, hopefully useful overview of his career, his evolution, his development uh, of an art, uh, as an artist. And um, yeah, so not all the works are actually ones that are on display, but certainly you will recognize a fair number of them. So starting with the pre the pre English days, um, and I think many of you will have listened to uh, Elizabeth Lamley talking about the cache of so called juvenilia that uh, she is working on in uh, partnership with the National Portrait Gallery, given to the gallery um, in lieu of death duties. I believe I mustn't go on too long about that, but um, suffice it to say that you know I won't talk too much about his very very early work. But anyway, here I start with a family photograph taken still in Germany, to say just a little bit about uh, the immediate family. Um, I think you all know, know, this is probably the best known fact about Lucien, that he is one of the grandsons or was one of the grandsons of the great and hugely immensely influential Sigmund Freud. But his father was also a very interesting individual, much less well known perhaps in this country than he deserves to be. A successful architect was Ernst in Berlin pre-war, serving a mostly middle-class Jewish clientele. And he manages more or less to pick up the threads of that career here in London. And uh, for those of you in Northwest London, uh, you may be aware of the complex of quite low lying and indeed quite unassuming uh, domestic architecture that's just opposite University College um, School in, in uh, Frognal, for example. There are many other examples of work that he created uh, once he'd come here in 1933. That date, of course, is, is, is crucial. Just a word about the, the brothers, three boys, as you can see, what a handful. Um, Lucien was the middle one. Uh, Stephen Gabriel was the eldest, seen on the right here. Notice the middle names, yeah? And Clement was the uh, youngest one. There he is, in fact, actually quite large uh, for his age, clearly, in uh, sort of a yeah, second from the right in the photograph. Um, you, I think, will be aware of Clement also having something of a public persona. He became a well-known food writer and critic and broadcaster and indeed, I think, humorist um, as well. Stephen kept a much lower profile. I, I don't think he actually was or is particularly well-known. Um, Lucien, there in the middle on the far left already, as you can see, I think a striking child, no question about it. Uh, Lucien's middle name was Michael and um, Clement's middle name was Raphael, which I think is actually quite interesting because although I'm not planning to dwell exclusively on the Jewishness of this family, I think it's not, well, it is significant that here is this obviously assimilated, um, you know, a, a cultured middle-class 
German Jewish family. But you know, why, in a sense, bother to give your sons middle names after the archangels? I think you know there is this sort of biblical sure. tug there that is, is perhaps quite quite telling. All right. Um, so what comes next? 1933. The family leave early, and I think this is absolutely crucial. Um, I'm going to just uh, move on to the next image. Uh, the family leave, and Ernst is already has been in England paving the way for the family's move. Um, in, but they make the definitive move in September 1933. Okay, so literally just a few months after Hitler becomes, is elected, of course, Chancellor of Germany in January. There's a whole cache, if you like, of correspondence that Elizabeth has talked about in some detail in her talk. Uh, just a reminder here of um, uh, work that in fact uh, we have now in public in the public arena um, and indeed it's been shown at the Freud Museum and I think some of you may have uh, attended the group visit to that very interesting in a sense companion uh, exhibition to the big retrospective currently on at the National. Uh, sticking just with this image that it seems to me I'm, well, no, I, I'm not really I'm just frustrated I did better can yesterday you, on the other thing. Can you please mute whoever it is making a noise there if you wouldn't mind muting yourself. Thank you. Um, where was I? Yes, no, you know, clearly there's a kind of a, an assurance and accomplishment to this early work, which belies the very young age at which it was produced. You know, he's 10, 11, 12. I mean, he's, he's 10 when he makes the move. This is done from, um, it's done in this country. We, we know that. So he's, you know, he's, 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 yes, he's pre-adolescent, clearly. Um, it seems to me that there isn't much inkling, and this is really perhaps for psychologists to unravel more than myself, to hint at the strangeness and the profound unease, if you like, that underlies so much of his mature work, but maybe that's something we can come back to later. Anyway, there are lots and lots, I mean, literally dozens of, of letters accompanied by drawings that Lucian writes to both his parents um, in these early years. More photographs just to get us going. He turns into an extremely handsome young man, uh, adolescent here on the left with his father, who incidentally was quite a keen amateur painter. The relationship between the two was not of the easiest and nor was it with his mother, which I will say more about later on. Um, I don't have an exact date for either of these. Clearly the image on the right is quite a lot later. And I think it gives one a clue to the kind of charisma. I mean, he's not, well, he is very good looking quite clearly, but in, a, in an intense sort of way, combined with a persona personality that was clearly never going to be a conventional one. He courted trouble, even scandal in his early days. He was constantly getting into scrapes from actually quite a young age, um, certainly through to his, his young um, adulthood. Um, and I think, you know, again, I'm, I'm speculating to some extent, but there is evidence to suggest that it was partly this intensely charismatic personality combined with his very you know, striking good looks that actually helped him get away, sometimes with blue murder, it has to be said. Interesting, though, you know, you look at this work here, this is a self-portrait. Um, it's not uh, an idealizing image at all. It's actually not glamorizing or beautifying his own image in the least. Um, so one, I think, needs to sort of <laughs> keep, keep that in mind that although while he, you know, he's aware, I think, of the power of his personality in terms of his physical appearance, he's not, he's not trying to uh, beautify, if you like, or indeed even be that realistic about the way he actually looks. Perhaps this is more about the way he felt at the time. Now, you'll notice the, um, the style. It's still quite childlike, isn't it? Now, let me just say a little bit about um, his early years in this country. Um, he is first of all sent to Dartington Hall. And while Dartington was known for its liberal educational um, system and indeed for the unconventional characters that populated both the student and the teaching population, he again, he, he didn't quite fit, he didn't get on that well. And eventually he was actually um, uh, taken away by his parents and went to the uh, slightly more satisfactory environment of Bryanston School, again, a kind of alternative boarding school for, for talented, artistically talented children. Um, 
by this point, he's already encountered um, a man who was to exercise quite a profound artistic and indeed general influence on his very early emergence as a, a precocious young artist. And that's somebody called Cedric Morris. I will show you one of his images. Um, he, um, Lucien that is, he, and Lucien incidentally was named after his mother, Lucy. <laughs> um, uh, so initially he, he attends a term at the Central School of Art, doesn't get on particularly well there, and then actually eventually goes to um, East Anglia to attend something actually called the East Anglian School of Painting and Drawing at Dedham, near you know, Constable Country, under the tutelage of Cedric Morris, this rather eccentric and indeed homosexual artist who was in charge um, with somebody called Arthur Letts of the establishment. Um, I don't want to push this too far, but I think if you look particularly, I don't know if you can see my cursor, I think you probably can, at the really apparently quite child look like simplification of form that you see, for example, in this male face. Yes, on, on the left there, and if I go back to this early self-portrait by Lucian, one can see something of that apparent naivety, yes, and almost impassivity of expression coming through. Anyway, uh, most of the time, Morris left Lucian to his own devices. He realized that there was, you know, an unusual talent in, in, in the making and, and he encouraged him uh, suitably. So I think it's fair to say he wasn't exactly self-taught, but, you know, it was a very idiosyncratic sort of training and slightly erratic training as an artist that he, he experienced. Now, this is an interesting one, which I'm sure you'll remember, those of you who've seen the show, Sorry, just noticing there's somebody wanting to be let in. Um, the refugees. Now, I was intrigued to note in a rather useful chronology, which indeed I could um, send to those signed up for the talk, um, in a kind of official chronology, if you like, of Lucian's um, uh, life, actually issued on the website of the so-called Lucian Freud Archives. So this is clearly an official sanction sort of um, uh, website. And in the entry for 1933, it says quite simply, Freud, or not simply really at all, Freud and his family moved to London. And then it says they are not refugees, but emigrate voluntarily. Now, I take issue with that, I have to say. You don't leave in the September of the year in which Hitler comes to power of your own free will. Nobody was pointing a gun at them, that is true. But to say that you are not refugees is, I think, an interesting thing, isn't it? And again, perhaps we can discuss this later. It has to do with self-image, I think, doesn't it? With, well, with all many complicated, psychologically complicated things. So here he is in contrast. Yes, we are emigres, we are not refugees, even though we came in the wake of Hitler's coming to power as a family, his immediate family, of course, hugely lucky for Zygmunt coming only after the Anschluss in Austria. It was much, much harder. And indeed for well, other now, people. really. I'm sorry, can you please make sure you're muted? Please. Thank you. Um, so obviously it's easier. You come younger, you come earlier. Um, so here, this is really rather extraordinary painting, still painted in this apparently quite naive, full frontal sort of style called the refugees. Now we do know, according to um, various sources, that the models were almost certainly the Freud family's dentist and his family who had indeed come later in the late 30s um, to, to, to the safety of England. So these are the refugees we are not. Interesting, I think. And I mean, look at the image. I find it really quite troubling on all sorts of levels. Notice, for example, this diminutive child with his uh, her, <laughs> uh, tongue stuck out, you know, almost defiantly kind of rude, confronting the spectator. Again, the rather impassive, um, gloomy, but, you know, not terribly expressive expressions of this assembled group of people. Um, it's, I think, the only work, to my knowledge, I think I'm right, that actually quite explicitly um, uses the term refugee and actually alludes to this profound displacement of so many people as a result of uh, the Third Reich. So again, perhaps to be discussed later. This is another work from the, um, from the, oops, sorry, there we go, from the exhibition, still in this uh, early, 
say it's even tentative, it's actually quite assured, isn't it? But in this distinctive sort of early style of the late 30s and very early 1940s. Um, apologies for the watermark from the archive, um, but uh, let's see where I found the image. Uh, I won't say much about this except to say that A, the girl in question was one of his many girlfriends at the time. But I also need to say, and I, I have mentioned that Cedric was gay, it's very interesting, and I'm still immersed in this very, very fat tome, the first volume of the uh, biography called The Lives, in the plural, of Lucian Freud by William Fever. And it's very, very clear from Fever's description of Freud's early years that actually there's a kind of sexual, if you like, ambiguity and ambivalence in the young Lucian. A lot of what Fever writes is actually based on conversations that he had with Lucian in later life, so he's not making anything up, I think. Um, it's quite clear that men were attracted to him, as indeed women are plenty, that he himself, although he, I think, as it were, officially denied that he was gay or even that way inclined, I think that element of sexual ambiguity and indeed ambivalence is um, significant when it comes later to looking at his images, both of men and women, particularly naked ones. Um, I should also say that the other thing that struck me very forcibly reading the Fever biography is the way that Freud, who incidentally kept a rather Germanic accent to the end of his life, even though he was you know, only 10 when he came to this country. Um, there is, um, I think, at least one film you can access online, so you might like to check that out for yourselves. Uh, but also that somehow, if you like, peppered in his conversation with Fever are these odd, I think, again, psychologically very interesting, almost throwaway remarks, not about himself as Jewish necessarily, or predominantly, but actually about Jews. And again, I, I will leave it at that, keep that question hanging, but it seems to me that he was, almost in spite of himself, very much aware, not only of being somebody who was not British born, but actually of being Jewish. And those kind of rather ambivalent remarks he makes about Jews in general, I think are very revealing. The other reason I, I put this image on um, is that you can see the uh, boat, the ship in the background, and indeed the other ship in the, in the far background. And this is a reminder that for a brief while, in 1941, in fact, the year that this was painted, uh, Lucien Freud actually did... Uh, um, sorry, I'm, <laughs> there's noise coming from, from the window outside. Um, he, he served us in, in the Merchant Navy. Now, we heard didn't we, from Helen Fry about the heroism of other members of the Freud family, not for Lucien, it has to be said. He didn't uh, volunteer for the military. It's true he was pretty young, but he, he could have. And in the end, it's a bit of a lark, I think it has to be said, and perhaps I'm being a little over cynical here, but he did it as a kind of boy's own adventure that he he volunteered he, uh, he, he, yeah, for the Merchant Navy. And in fact, he didn't last very long because he was quite sickly. I think it was actually tonsillitis. Anyway, his health was not of the best and he was actually invalided out quite soon, I think only after a matter of months. And on board too, the, the ship he found himself on, he was very much the, the odd board, the outsider, the, 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 the one who didn't, who didn't fit. Now, I've always been intrigued by this painting, as I'm sure you are. This shows a different style emerging, doesn't it? It's tighter, it's more assured, less obviously childlike, and indeed the surrealist strangeness of these disparate objects put together is very, very striking. I don't think there's a direct link or you know, influence from the surrealist group proper to Freud's work of this period, but nevertheless, the surrealist element is, is undoubtedly there. Um, this is the year in which he actually has his first one-man exhibition in London at the Alex Reed and Lefebvre Gallery in the West End, so he's doing, he's doing well, he's only 22. So I won't, I haven't got time really to go into too much detail about individual images, but you know, notice this rather manky plant, we'll see more of that kind of fascination with the organic forms of nature, but actually in a state of, of decay, if you like, not at their best. Notice also the, again, decaying, you know, the kind of decrepit uh, aspects of the, of the um, sofa there. And of course, you know, what on earth is that zebra <laughs> doing, poking its head through the window and so on and so forth. Very much the stuff of a dream. Sigmund Freud. Now, of course, Lucien, well, not of course, but Lucien vehemently denied that there was any direct connection between his, his grandfather's uh, 
writings and his own work, but you know, one can't help wondering. Quickly, and I'm aware of, of time running on, um, an early, another self-portrait, a little bit later than the 1939 ones. Again, I think you can see that um, greater assurance and tightness and linearity, if you like, of style that is very much a characteristic of his um, early work. Uh, I'm intrigued by the white feather with its um, pacifist and indeed implications of perhaps being a coward as well, going back to the First World War. And I can't help wondering, I can't prove this, whether there is an oblique comment in this work, almost in spite of himself, a feeling of, of, of is it guilt? Is it, is it sort of embarrassment? Not quite embarrassment, but that he's actually not doing more perhaps for the war effort, because, you know, look at the date, we're still in the midst of the war of which the outcome was still deeply uncertain. Notice the hands, these extraordinarily large and expressive hands. We'll see more of that later. Now, self-portraits are a recurring motif in his career. I'm sure you're already aware of that. So let me just show you a few more. These two works are both in the exhibition and very remarkable they are too. They confront us, don't they, with a kind of unflinching scrutiny and gaze, the thistle prickly uncomfortable like the gaze of Lucien on the left there and on the right also a very memorable work slightly later um, in crayon and it's a reminder I think of his extraordinary at this point and indeed beyond technical skill not just in oil paint but also with other media this is crayon on paper. I'm sure you'll remember this, it's hard to forget it once you've seen it. Um, Girl with a Kitten. Now, what it doesn't say in the exhibition, I don't think, no, it doesn't, is very interesting. And actually, one thing I should say for those of you who've seen the show, that I was quite um, startled, if you like, by the paucity of biographical context or information given at the National Gallery show. There's a little bit, isn't there, in the introductory panel. Some of the images have a bit of you know, extended caption, but very little information is given. It's as though the curators, and I can sort of understand why, want to deflect attention from the rather sensationalist aspect of Freud's personal life to focus attention entirely on the works as aesthetic objects. Well, as I say, fair enough, but I think actually, hopefully, what I'm telling you will help kind of enrich the experience of looking at the works. So, for example, what it doesn't say is that this portrait, again, quite disturbing, is it not, as she clutches, almost seeming to strangle this cat with eyes very much like her own, um, is in fact of his first wife, a very interesting person in her own right. Kitty Garman was her name, and Kitty was the um, daughter of Kathleen Garman and Jacob Epstein, one of the greatest of Jewish and indeed non-Jewish modern sculptures, I think most people would agree. Okay, so there's that interesting link with kind of Jewish immigrant culture there. He painted her and indeed did drawings of her many times in their brief and turbulent relationship. Another one, larger, also very memorable, look at the way she's clutching that rose, why is there no blood, yeah, um, is this one here in the exhibition. Again, this is Kitty. Now, as an art historian, I want to, I can't really resist, you know, sort of introducing images by others for you to think about. Now, Lucien himself, I think, again, strongly denied that there was any direct influence coming from the tradition of modern or interwar, I would say, German modernist art, known in English often as new objectivity, neue Sachlichkeit in, in, in German. Um, but look at this, just look at this. I mean, Christian Schad in my book is one of the most extraordinary and most disturbing of all the new objectivity artists, most of whose careers incidentally were cut short brutally by the Nazi regime, not all, but that's another, another story. But I think you will agree that there is a kindred spiritness, isn't there? I mean, look at the, again, that unflinching frontal look, the ultimate enigma, if you like, of both these figures. And I am willing to bet that consciously or not, there is some influence coming from this 
very Germanic interwar tradition into Lucian's early-ish work. And it wouldn't be surprising, I mean, Ernst and Lucy had a very fine library of art books in uh, 1920s, early 30s Germany, they consorted with other artists and intellectuals. And I, you think, you know, this kind of art would indeed have been familiar to Lucian, whether he liked to admit it or not. I think those of you who've seen the show will also be struck that that unflinching gaze, I keep using that term, also um, in, it, 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 it fell on inanimate objects, not just humans in the late, well, the 40s and, and, and the 50s and indeed beyond. So you get uh, both of these in the show. I mean, they are profoundly disturbing, aren't they? Um, particularly, I suppose, the one on the, on the right there, looking death in the face in a very, very, um, unrelenting, unforgiving sort of way, but look how beautifully crafted they are as well. Into the 1950s, now this work, I think it's true to say, marks his uh, beginning really of establishing a reputation in the British art world. It was actually um, commissioned, I think it was actually, yes, it was commissioned, but certainly included in an exhibition that formed part of the 1951 Festival of Britain, of course, that great post-war celebration of, you know, of, of, of Britain re-emerging from the traumas of war, um, in which indeed so many emigres contributed, that's a whole other subject, a rich and important one. So, yes, this one shows him entering, if you like, a more public sort of arena as an artist. Look at that manky plant again. Look at uh, the rather, you know, sort of shabbily dressed main protagonist. And I discovered actually just <laughs> doing a bit of browsing on the internet this very morning that somebody made, I think, a rather astute comparison between the pose of the sitter on the left, um, who somebody called Harry uh, Diamond, who became a close, a close friend, a, a rather colorful and slightly disreputable character, and one of many portraits one might single out, but particularly this portrait by Hans Holbein the Younger of Henry VIII. I mean, look at, you know, the similarities, the clenched hands and so on, even the pose itself, I think is a kind of slightly tongue in cheek, possibly unconscious reference to this tradition of kind of state portraiture and how utterly it subverts it. Going back to his personal life, and it is indeed, it has to be said, a pretty colorful one. Here's a, an etching, it shows how he has mastered the medium by this point quite unequivocally. Um, notice the rose and what is that? Is it a feather? Is it almost like a dagger? You know, sort of quite strange and, and disturbing. Kitty in Paris and well, I think it's pretty clear, isn't it, that their marriage is falling apart. This is not going to last very long. It's a real image of anguish and unease, isn't it? Really, really upsetting. So too with this one here, um, done a bit later, this is actually not Kitty, as you can see for yourself. This is his second wife. He actually teamed up quite soon after his divorce from Kitty with actually an English aristocrat called Caroline Black, Lady Caroline Blackwood. And here is a painting, again, it's in the show, it's small, it's absolutely devastating, as I think you can see. Even in reproduction, uh, again, that, you know, here, there he is, sort of skulking, as it were, standing in the background, and what a picture of utter alienation between two human beings. Quite, quite extraordinary. And so too, unsurprisingly, this marriage didn't last very long. And I have to say that thereafter, one begins to lose track of his amorous entanglements with women. Although I should say that it's possible, again, it's not absolutely crystal clear that he may have had let's say a homosexually tinged relationship with the poet Stephen Spender and possibly others besides, but certainly in later life, his relationships seem to have been uh, predominantly and possibly exclusively um, heterosexual. So I won't, um, you know, go through the kind of the role, if you like, the, the role call of all the women he had relationships with and indeed many children with, although I will come back to some of them a little bit later on. So, no idea for time. A photograph that takes us into the 1960s by uh, John Deacon, who was a pal of all these 
men, I do say that quite pointedly. Um, but as you can see, we're looking at some of the great and good of um, a group that actually later was dubbed, if that's the word, the School of London by the Jewish um, uh, American born artist Abi Kitai, who indeed ultimately becomes one of this group and talks about them as the School of London not a British school, but the School of London. Staunchly figurative, powerfully engaged with, if you like, the difficulty of being human. Anyway, so who have you got? And um, you've got Lucien, you can recognize him, I'm sure there, sort of second from the left, slightly already slightly dissolute looking Francis Bacon. Here's a young Frank Auerbach, Michael Andrews, Andrews rather less well known, but uh, I'll come back to him as well. So in other words, by the early 60s, uh, and as we'll see, in fact, beyond before that too, he's beginning to mix with artists who would emerge as some of the major figures in contemporary, or certainly mid-century, second half of the 20th century, modern art. He paints most of them, as you might expect. Uh, Francis Bacon is certainly a major figure in all this, not Jewish, but Irish gay and outsider in different ways. And here is a very extraordinary, tightly painted, again, emotionally kind of taut close up of, um, uh, Lucien uh, uh, of sorry, Francis Bacon by, by Lucien. And I thought it would also be useful for you to see an unfinished work, also a portrait of his friend Bacon, which shows the way in which he actually creates, constructs an image starting, yes, from the centre and then working outwards, not necessarily sketching in the complete image beforehand. I thought also it might interest you to see um, how Freud in turn figures in Lucien Freud's work. Um, a photograph taken again by John Deakin, 1964, and quite clearly the basis for this rather extraordinary, very you know, recognizably Bacon-esque uh, image of Lucien himself, the middle section of a triptych, and oh no, I didn't actually put in the triptych, um, for, I was worried about having too many images, but yes, it, it's part of a, uh, a triptych which shows Lucien in slightly different poses um, from the same sort of period, obviously. Again, just sticking for the moment with this sort of social and artistic milieu in which um, Freud is, is, is mixing and, and living in the uh, later 50s or early 50s through the 50s and beyond, as you, as you can see. John Minton, um, less well known, I, I suspect many of you won't have heard of him, but uh, an interesting artist, nevertheless, British born. I mean, look at the Ken, that sort of emotional tautness of this very tightly painted image on the left and a very memorable portrait of the man who was to become a very close friend and, and, and ally, if you like, of Lucien Freud, namely Frank Auerbach, who is of the whole group, the only one still alive today. Not, I think, in the best of health, but still, still with us. Born in Germany, as you probably know, who comes as a younger child, age eight, without his family, without his parents, to England. His parents die in the Holocaust. And this is not a lecture about Auerbach, but clearly that is very significant. Look also at the way the different styles, and I think this pair of images serves a purpose to, to show this really quite dramatic, gradual, but dr ultimately quite dramatic transition from this very tightly painted, just imagine what tiny brushes he must have used for the one on the left, to the much more loosely painted, much more painterly, almost expressionist handling of the medium um, in to the 60s and indeed thereafter, things are changing. Ah, just, just briefly before we carry on with, with Lucien's work, um, here to just reinforce the sort of sense of a very tightly knit, if you like, community of artists, um, very much alluding to each other and using each other as models, double portrait by Bacon of Freud and Auerbach. And here back to uh, Lucien himself, an unusually, um, am I right? Yes, I was going to use the word tender. I mean, it's, it's an intimate and actually does, I think really actually quite unusually for Freud overall, show uh, an intimacy and a tenderness, 
and even a kind of unspoken interaction between the couple, Michael and June Andrews, who saw Michael, fellow artist, in the photograph. But this also shows this kind of loosening up of the paintwork. A work which I am sure that you will um, remember from the exhibition, a rather extraordinary one. Uh, he used mirrors a lot, uh, sometimes deliberately distorting perspective for the self-portrait, mid 60s. Who are the two children? Well, well, may you ask, there's no clue in the uh, exhibition, but I can tell you that they are in fact two kids that he had with somebody called Susie Boyd one of the many liaisons that, and indeed many sort of liaisons that ended up in him becoming a father again and again and again. And I think without me really having to say very much more, the kind of unease, if you like, the distance between himself and the kids is pretty palpable. Uh, better known among his children are Bella and Esther. Bella became a uh, or indeed is a, a well-known fashion designer. Esther Freud will be well known to many of you, a wonderful novelist. She gave a talk for Jewish Renaissance just uh, a few weeks ago and it's uh, been recorded if you'd like to revisit it or visit it. Um, their mother was somebody called Bernadine Coverley, just for the record. Um, in many cases, he does indeed paint. He's not completely an absent father, but they are strange, I have to say, they're pretty strange works, are they not? Look at the ungainliness, the awkwardness, yeah? Deliberately, I mean, presumably he suggested that they should pose in a particular way. These are full siblings as it were, but there's a sense again of the kind of awkwardness of the relationship and the awkwardness of them to their painter father. And, I realize that I actually haven't shown you any of his nudes yet. That's coming, <laughs> coming with a vengeance. I start with one that perhaps is, for very obvious reasons, one of the most unsettling of the lot. It's in the exhibition. He painted his children naked as well. What do we make of this? I'm not gonna say any more, but again, that's perhaps something we can come back to. Clearly they consented, yeah? Let's think about that one. So moving on now to works which are emphatically, although not always just of the naked human figure. I will run through these fairly quickly, but I, I just I think you know, it's really important to get a good sense of what they are like. Um, notice um, again the title, Large Interior West Nine. He's living and he continues to leave, live in a rather dowdy, you know, down at heel part of, of, of West London, the Paddington area, where, you know, he, he makes most of the work. Um, this is his mother. I wonder what she made of it all. Um, he didn't, and I think this is important, he didn't, I think I'm right in saying, ever pose his figures, such as here, in the same place at the same time. They were done separately, which I think is interesting also, does actually confirm the sort of sense again of distance, psychological distance that you see here. Now I haven't said about much about his mother yet, so I think now is the time to do so. She was called Lucy Brush, was her, her, her maiden name, educated, cultured, went to university, I think in Munich it was. Clearly Lucien was her favorite son. Now a mother should never <laughs> show favoritism, but she did. And it's quite clear from what he said later, and indeed from the early correspondence, and there is much of it, that actually he found that sense of being her favorite really very difficult, a burden that he didn't really want to live with. And as he moves away from his family, it is, I think, on one level, profound level, very much moving away from the kind of overprotectiveness and over um, affection, sort of, you know, over, yes, uh, yeah, um, attention of, of his mother, Lucy. What I think is also very interesting is that when his father Ernst dies in 1970, it's only then, only then, in the very early 70s, that he starts painting his mother, he starts using her as a subject. And indeed, they, you know, it's always a difficult relationship, a complicated one, but um, uh, it's then that they get closer again. And he does a whole series, and there are indeed some in the exhibition. Uh, these two give a sense that there was definitely more than one, and indeed very extraordinary 
they are too. One could give a whole lecture on this image. Um, they're very rarely more than two people in his late, later compositions. I think you can see why I'm, I'm, I'm hesitating slightly. It's so subversive and unusual in so many ways, is it not? The male nude splayed out on this coach, the woman artist, but do notice some telling details like her naked foot, her yeah, bare foot sort of pressing on the tube of paint with all its possibly Freudian connotations. Um, this is not the norm in Western art history, is it? Since when is it the female artist painting the male nude? This is a whole important subject in itself. So he is in many ways kind of, you know, asking us to think afresh at that tradition. I could go on longer about that, but I, I won't again, it provides much food for thought. Sure, uh, sorry, for thought. It is also important to let you know that um, the rather introverted looking painter, female painter on the left was yet another of his um, amours, if I can use that uh, word, and actually rather talented and interesting painter in her own right called Celia Paul, with whom he had a relationship in the 1980s and indeed had a child as well. And again, just this morning, I came across this image, which I think is worth including. Um, this is very telling. It was done in the year after Lucien died. Here is Celia Paul, very tellingly, I think, calling herself painter and model. She is both the model and the painter of this picture. Again, a psychologically complex intervention. They're pretty uncompromising, aren't they? Uh, and I'm interested to know how many of you actually felt uneasy or possibly even a little bit embarrassed looking at images such as this. This one, I think, was not actually in the show, <clears throat> you know, with a, with, with a group of, of, of people. Perhaps that's something, too, we can discuss. And look at this. It's not just that he's burying himself quite literally, but look, he's holding almost affectionately a rat. What's all that about? Back to pairs of images. This one's another interesting one, the clothed male. And what's the naked man in the background doing? He's holding a baby. Again, gender relations are, are completely, you know, sort of challenged here. I think that Lucian once said, well, oh, the only reason I put the figure on the, the back holding the baby is that in fact the female model didn't turn up. But that's, you know, don't take it at <laughs> face value, not at all. Tenderness. I mean, you know, despite the complete lack of idealization, this kind of warts and all approach to the naked body, male and female, there is, in some of the work at least, undoubtedly a tenderness. And, well, <laughs> the dog you'll notice is a recurrent motif. Um, Again, I think almost certainly not painted with the two figures actually in physical proximity. Is this going too far? I wonder. Um, and here's another one. She was called Sue Tilly, I believe, who became one of her his favorite models in this period. Notice that she's not named, and there is a kind of slightly wry, uh, sardonic humour, I think, in that the title of the work is Benefits Supervisor. She's identified by her work rather than by herself, not, you know, her individual sort of identity. Um, I think we can't help but feel uncomfortable in confrontation with work like this. And just to perhaps explain or help us understand why that might be, I'd like to kind of look sideways as it were, firstly to a work that's in the National Gallery. And actually one thing I haven't mentioned, which you probably discussed in situ is, isn't it rather extraordinary that Lucian Freud, unequivocally a 20th century and indeed 21st century painter is given this major retrospective at the National Gallery full of old masters. And indeed his work is full of often quite direct and sometimes oblique references to old master painting. But I think that is actually raising questions of its own, is it not? And here you are then, here's a work in the National. How different. Coily turning her rather beautifully streamlined, conventionally lovely naked body from the spectator. Just go back to that. 
And then perhaps even more usefully, this is not in the national, but you know, here's a rather famous Goya, the nude uh, Maya, anatomically somewhat improbable, but you know, with her coy inviting gaze, this is absolutely the norm, is it not? When you think of the female nude, reclining female nude, going back to the reclining Venus, Titian, Ang, you name it, that is absolutely the staple of Western art. How far can you go in rebellion, in rejection, and yet still in reference to that tradition? And drawing to an end now, I promise you, um, I couldn't resist putting these two side by side. And indeed, I think, as I recall, that these two are actually in the same room together. Um, here is Sutili again, um, in physical proximity to another very different kind of portrait. One of the um, ironies I find in Lucian's late career is that he actually becomes sought after by the rich and famous. Um, and here is a British aristocrat posing officially, you know, for a commissioned portrait. But I think seeing them together is quite telling because look carefully at the physiognomy and indeed the hands and possibly the slightly uneasy uh, pose of the brigadier here on the right. And <coughs> so too, this portrait of Jacob Rothschild, one of the trustees of the National Gallery. This is not an idealized portrait. Is this really what somebody would want to see themselves represented by, and yet, you know, these were accepted, these, these portraits. Once more, look at those hands. And again, the art historian in me says, hmm, interesting. I mean, think, no, exactly, think of Otto Dix. I mean, look at, look at this, look at these hands. Very much a feature of Otto Dix's work from the 1920. Yeah, hands, more hands of the male sitter. Flechtheim, incidentally, was a very interesting Jewish emigre art dealer who ended up in this country. And the other um, artist I want to, from the past, I want to introduce very, very briefly here is somebody that we know a friend of, an early friend of Freud's actually owned works by Soutine. So this is not entirely fanciful, I think, at all. This is a very interesting connection, I think, because we've seen that from the 60s onwards, Lucian Freud has abandoned his tight, taut style for a much more expressionistic handling of paint. And I think somewhere in there is a nod, and perhaps more than a nod, to the great Jewish, Russian-born School of Paris artist, Chaim Soutine, who's not only an extraordinarily powerful expressionist artist, but I mean, look at these portraits, look at the hands, look at the distortion of form. Uh, if I just, again, just go back, yeah, to this, actually, I shouldn't. Yes, this complete unglamorization that we've seen in, in Freud's work. And um, yes, this kind of, I was going to say a reversion, of course, it's not really a reversion, but the way that Freud, in his mature work, turns to this expressionist tradition, which actually many people have construed or interpreted as somehow quintessentially Jewish, which is something else we can perhaps come back to, is, I think, again, very, very interesting. You will, I'm sure, have noticed it's really very small compared with most of his late work, but it was, believe it or not, commissioned for the royal collection of our late queen. Again, you think, gosh, you know, why on earth would the royal family or indeed the queen herself want to see herself represented like this? And yet again, he, he got away with it. And here is, I think, quite a telling port, uh, photograph of him at work. You get a sense of the tiny scale of this, um, of this official portrait with his her slightly, um, what should we say, quizzical, <laughs> uh, slightly ill at ease expression on her face. Now the next painting, uh, uh, next drawing I should say is an upsetting one, but it is in the show. Um, I thought it was in a way apposite given the Queen's recent death to insert here an extraordinarily uh, intimate, heartbreaking, honest portrait by Lucian of his dead mother. He wasn't afraid to look death in the face. And I want to end just with two very, very remarkable self-portraits. One from the 90s when he's in his 70s, again, looking at us, but with the help of a mirror. He's been accused of being a misogynist, a misanthrope perhaps. 
His work is certainly a far cry from idealizing the human body. There is no doubt about that, but it's both male and female. And I would say looking at a brutally honest, full frontal work like this, complete with these ungainly, almost ridiculous uh, floppy slippers, that if a man, an artist turns that gaze on himself, then surely he can't be accused of being um, certainly not a misogynist, uh, certainly not, I think, a misanthrope. Uh, and also, this is the last image, yeah, uh, a late self-portrait. Again, that sort of honesty with which he confronts both mortality and old age, the fading of good looks, uh, the act of being a painter. And I just want to end with one quotation from him, which I think you will all agree, is very apposite. The task of the artist is to make the human being uncomfortable. Thank you. <laughs> Let me stop screen sharing and I think we have a little bit of time for questions and comments. I hope there will be some. Um, Aviva, I don't know whether you are still with us, whether you want to feel the questions or indeed Emma, if Aviva isn't here. I actually asked Emma if I could ask a question. Um, if that's okay. And yeah, of course. Yeah. Many, many, um, but I'm sure there are other people in the room who do too. Um, can I start off though by asking you about that early work? Because one of the things I was very struck by, um, and it might have been because that portrait of John Minton was in there. And also I saw a John Minton exhibition at Pallant House mm. a few years ago, which had a Minton portrait of Freud. Um, they clearly were close in that very early period. And Minton and also Minton's friend Susan Einzig, mm. um, who, another Jewish refugee, <laughs> I'm sure you know, um, at that point made their money primarily by being book illustrators. Mm. And I did wonder about that early work of Freud, whether it was more, you know, illustrative, if that's who he was surrounded by and was part of his influences and what you know about that. That's a really interesting point. I hadn't really thought of it. It's, it's a really good, you know, valid observation. Um, to my knowledge, he didn't actually, and this is a very pedantic response to your question, but you know, a kind of just prosaic, excuse me, prosaic one. To my knowledge, he didn't actually work or produce any book illustrations. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of one answer that clearly he saw his painting as self-sufficient, not related to having to earn a living as an illustrator. And yet, I think that's an interesting, that's, that's something that I will continue to think about. So thanks, mm. thanks for that, yeah. Um, and then just, just to take on to the paintings, if we're thinking about kind of those comparisons um, that you made, um, I thought it was really interesting you brought Soutine in, mm. because I have to admit seeing the exhibition in, my, in the flesh, as it were, <laughs> literally, but seeing the paintings up close rather than reproductions really changed my perspective on mm. Freud as a painter. Mm. So beforehand, and for the last 20 years, I kept thinking there was um, a Soutine exhibition. It was about, I, well, I know exactly, it was 21 years ago because I worked on the very first year of Jewish Renaissance. And I remember there was an essay in one of the issues that I was a junior editor on, because I was giving it to edit, where someone made the parallel. They said, you know, if you're looking at which of Soutine and Freud one would call a Jewish artist, it's about the gays. And they said Soutine paints sides of flesh because he often painted meat and things as if they were human beings with emotional warmth. Christian Freud paints human beings as if they were sides of flesh. Yeah. And I thought that for like years and years. Mm. And then I saw this exhibition, I thought, actually, there is such tenderness. Mm. And what like those paintings of Sue Tilly, like the expressions on her face. I actually feel like of all the women, she was the one he really liked mm. and warmed to. So I wonder what you make of that, like. Why is it? Is it just because in the re reproduction some of that emotion goes flat or why is it he's accused of being kind of such a cold painter when there well, is... Again, that's, as I'd expect from you, Aviva, that's a very 
you know, a good and astute, astute question. Yeah, it's partly, isn't it? There is no substitute. And you know, those of you who've been recently to the National Gallery will, will know exactly what I'm talking about, particularly when a painter is so painterly, there's such physicality in the handling of paint, no substitute at all. I mean, here am I, you know, pontificating on screen, everything's flat, you know, you have to go and see work. I'm constantly telling my university students that, you know, you have to go and see the work for yourself, particularly when it is so tactile and physical. So yes, I mean, that's certainly one answer. Um, it's also, I suppose, it's that sort of sense, perhaps, of a kind of emotional apparent detachment that, that might, you know, provoke certain, not just women, but also men, you know, male commentators as well, to accuse them of a kind of lack of compassion, a lack of warmth. And it's, they're not overly warm images. I think it's true, isn't it? And yet they are compassionate. There is sometimes a tenderness and certainly a sense of the vulnerability, my goodness, of the human form and one thing you know i didn't mention um but i think it's very evident when you think back to my comparison between the reclining soup tilly and the goya and the velasquez um kenneth clark director of course of the national gallery gallery very famously wrote a book on the nude and made the distinction between the naked and the nude and you know what better you know sort of uh, illustration of that is you know lucian freud his kind of exposure of the nakedness, i.e. the vulnerability of the human form. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna, let me just ask before I carry on, because we are coming to close, are there other people who have questions? Is there anyone who was on the tour who, who wasn't before I do? Yes, Francesca, so let me, let's bring you in before I. Ooh, you're, you're mute. Are you muted? Um, we, we can't hear you. Mm. Do you want to Can you type your question in the chat yeah. then, Francesca? Sorry, but stay on screen, but we'll see if. Ah, the blessings of technology. That's <laughs> really it's great when it's great when it works. Let me ask you, I, I don't know how many of you were actually with Aviva at the National Gallery, but how did you feel, you know, as a group, um, actually encountering the work in, 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 in the flesh? Was there was there a sense of unease or discomfiture or even embarrassment? Aviva, maybe Francesca was one of the people with oh, all right, okay. Can can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear somebody now. Lionel, I think. Peter Vogel. Oh, Peter. There we go. I, I, I was at the exhibition and came away uh, um, reinforcing my opinion that he's such a wonderful artist. Mm. But my overall feeling was of bleakness. Mm. Um, everything is, every painting of families or individuals is so bleak. Did this uh, reflect his view of the world? It's interesting that, isn't it? I mean, it's not a happy vision of humanity. Um, I would say that the bleakness is, I don't think, you know, he didn't talk, he actually didn't like talking much, certainly not in public or to strangers about what he was doing as, as an artist. Um, I don't know if bleak's quite the right word. Um, there's a sense perhaps of honesty of the fact, you know, an acknowledgement of mortality, which, can't be accidental given his family background. And I would say perhaps just reiterating what Aviva and I were talking about just now is that perhaps the bleakness is redeemed up to a point anyway, by this sort of sense of compassion for the vulnerability of, of the flesh. Does that sound pompous? It probably does, but you know, I think it's not total bleakness. And also thank, the kind of sheer prowess, sheer prowess of his artistry maybe also is part of that sort of redemptive aspect. But I, I can see why you, you know, I said you can see why you can say that. Francesca, have you uh, typed in? Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it's part question, part wondering out loud, mm. really. Um, I was thinking about the drawing when he was a little boy, mm. of the little goat and the big horse. Um, and I thought about him being a little boy and uh, with a, his father and his grandfather, I thought, as a towering figure in his life. And I wondered if it's too far-fetched. I am a psychoanalyst, so forgive me. <laughs> if it's too far-fetched to link it with the painting of the zebra, because it's the, the, they're facing the same way, the, the zebra yeah, and I, the horse. And I thought there was something about him coming in, his, his childhood self coming in to the building as in this much more potent way um, once he becomes a man. Um, so that was my wondering. But I also thought, because there's also a couch in that, in that painting mm -hmm. with the zebra. Um, 
But I also thought there was something about his unflinching gaze and his tenderness, which are the two qualities you need if you're going to be a psychoanalyst. Mm, um, so I think he is his grandfather's grandson. Absolutely. You know, I fear he doth protest too much. I mean, I think the more he says, no, 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 you know, <laughs> nothing, you know, my art has nothing to do with my grandfather, the more you think, well, actually, hold on a second. Absolutely. And it also flitted across my own mind that that kind of possible link between the horse and the very young image, uh, the boyhood image and, and the zebra in that later work. Yes, no, indeed. Thank you for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's almost impossible not to speculate, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course, I mean, you were making those comparisons with the new Zachlechkeit images and mm -hmm. When I think of people like George Gross and Otto Dix and that whole era, you do think of exactly that combination, that kind of absolutely unflinching, even sometimes carrying to the sense of satire and caricature, but then also you do get a kind of emotional heat sometimes as well that seems to be there. I think it's probably, I mean, Gross is obviously a major figure in all that, but he's much more politically uh, explicit, which of course you don't find in Lucian's work. I think Otto Dix and Christian Schad, the two in my book, particularly in relation to their portraits, mm -hmm. uh, where the, the, the affinity seems to me quite, mm -hmm. quite evident. Again, whether he liked to admit it or not. Do you not think some of those portraits of people in power are political, like the, the taking the brigadier, the figure of power, but deliberately expressing him as kind of more vulnerable with a bulging out stomach or yeah. quite cold on setting portrait of the queen to us. When we were going around and talking about it, we said, well, if this isn't a Republican portrait, we don't know what is. Yeah, absolutely. And what I find, you know, amazing in view of that, I completely agree with you, is that actually it was accepted. You know, mm. was he was he big enough a name by that now, by that point, you know, 2001, that actually the royal family felt, well, actually, we can't actually rejected but it is quite extraordinary you're right I mean they're not explicitly political in the conventional sense of the word but yes of course they're completely subverting expectations of what a official aristocratic or royal portrait should and indeed has been in the past yeah amazing let me just do one last call out is there anybody else who would like to say anything or speak no so let, let me bring it back to Monica and do one final question to you then, which is, you spoke at the beginning at that, about that kind of reluctance to call himself a refugee, yeah. you know, to be an emigre. Yeah. And it was certainly something we know that was in contrast with other members of the Freud family who came later. There was this kind of sense of, because they got citizenship, that they were British in a way that the other members of the Freud family, maybe the cousins, weren't. Um, we've talked about him a little bit as a Jewish artist. I'm just curious what you make of him as a British artist and right. how is he as a British Jew? Like, what has his influence been? Are there people you think drawing from him now or into the future? Again, that's a good, big, big question, isn't it? Um, I was just trying to find actually in, in my the large tome, the, the biography, but actually it's quite interesting that that declaration, yes, we are not, ref we were not refugees, we were, we emigrated voluntarily, but it's actually prefaced in one of the fever um, uh, references by something like, oh, I know it was harder for those who came later, which in a way is very, very telling. Um, he was naturalized incidentally, just for the record, already in 1939, so therefore not interned. I mean, that's that's part of the, the bigger story. Um, you know, he was lucky. He comes early when it was possible to bring every, you know, your belongings, the family brought everything with them. He came with his immediate family. He was cushioned and he was young. He was resilient, you know, so it's a whole different ball game to somebody like Frank Auerbach, who comes as a younger boy, um, you know, when it was already nearly too late and he loses his parents in the Holocaust, you know, and, and he never spoke about it. That's a whole other, another conversation. Um, I think my impression is, and I didn't sadly ever meet him, is from what I've read and heard is that he, in a sense, quite enjoyed never quite belonging. Again, this insider outsider perennial syndrome, um, but actually didn't mind too much, almost, almost reveled in it. Um, he never, you know, I think he would never have called himself a British artist. He didn't balk at the idea of this school of London, which Kitai, you know, applied to this very, you know, yeah, well, absolutely, no, absolutely. Most of them were Jewish in, in the group uh, no, no, or, or outsiders in a, in a different way. Um, 
In terms of his influence, um, an interesting one that I think um, one artist who comes to mind and it's interesting that she's a woman is Jenny Saville. I don't know how many of you know her work. Check her out. It's with one L, I think, Jenny Saville. She does these monumental uh, nudes, often of her own quite large body, absolutely full frontal and, and you know up close and intimate, completely again unflinching. And I think she would undoubtedly you know sort of uh, agree that Freud influenced uh, you know sort of exercised an influence on her, and which in a way again I think kind of undercuts this idea that he might have been a misogynist. Um, mm. So certainly that's one person who comes to mind. But I think the sort of sense of the nakedness of the human body, the sexual frankness as well, the what's and all, you know, it, it, it's it's had a distinct you know, a kind of liberating influence on a, on a lot of artists, I, I would say, yeah. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, all, for so much, Monica, for that frank and um, warts and all hours lecture. Um, I've really enjoyed it. I know that it added a great deal to my understanding of the exhibition, and it's left me thinking, I actually need to go back again and look at the paintings <laughs> with what you said behind it. Particularly, I love, you know, that that idea of what does it mean that he's in this gallery of old masters, mm. um, how fascinating that is. Mm. Um, I just wanted to say two things as part of my thank you um, about Monica. I mean, I don't know those of you who know Monica, who is a fabulous art historian, but also just so knowledgeable about emigre history. Um, she is the founder of Insiders Outsiders, um, which is the festival and now an ongoing series exploring the influence of those emigre, well, not just artists, but creatives of all kinds who've contributed to um, British society as a whole. And she's worked with us, she works with us a huge amount at Jewish Renaissance. She is um, a very important member of our editorial committee. She focuses on art, but she also helps us program our series and our events. Um, if you haven't seen it, I would recommend you watch last night, which was about our, it was our launch issue for our current issue, which focused on Lithuania, because that included, I think she was the very last speaker, Monica talking actually about her mother's work, Dorothy Bohm, who was indeed one of those refugee and emigre um, creatives. She was a photographer um, and her work and more is explored by Monica, but also Next week, next Monday night, we are beginning our new sort series. This was the end of our Freud centenary. We're beginning our new series about the contribution of Jews to the BBC and also the influence um, the BBC has had on the Jewish community. It works both ways. It's a complicated relationship. We're actually starting it off with looking at some of Lloyd's, Alem Lucy and Freud's peers, those very kind of Jewish emigre creatives in the 1950s, 60s and onwards. Um, and that's going to be a discussion between um, Daniel Snowman and who is a former senior producer at the BBC with David Hendy, who is the author of The People's History, the book celebrating the centenary of the BBC this year, chaired by David Herman. So both David and Daniel work with Monica at Insiders Outsiders. So that's kicking us off in the BBC, but Monica, you're going to be seeing a lot during the whole series because Insiders Outsiders, as well as Lines Learning, where Emma is from, have been our partners in running these series and events. Monica is going to be introducing us to Alan Yentob. We're going to be meeting the children of famous Jewish um, dramatists and um, Others, so we're going to be meeting Amy, the daughter of Jack Rosenthal, Monica, the daughter of Martin Estlin, um, Jonathan, the son of William, um, sorry, William, the son of Jonathan Miller. We are going to be having conversations with um, the former head of politics and news at the BBC, Mark de Meza. We're going to be looking at what's happening to religious broadcasting. Um, there's just going to be an amazing series of events plus one that is specifically called Insiders Outsiders, which Monica will be chairing and in conversation about. So please come along to that. And I hope we'll see you there. And I hope anyone who isn't a, an already a subscriber to the magazine will subscribe and continue to enjoy 
this renaissance in Jewish culture. Thank you again, Monica, for a fabulous talk and have a good rest of your day, everyone. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Goodbye, everyone.